There we go. All right, what is up everybody? Tama Girl here with another Learn Rust live stream. If you've been joining us before, welcome back. If you're new to the stream or you're watching on YouTube, welcome as well. Thank you so much for joining. Tonight we're gonna to be doing something pretty cool. I'm pretty excited about it. It's something I've done in the past for other languages. We're gonna try it out here today for Rust and that is exorcism.org. Exorcism.org is a really cool CLI driven tutorial where you try out different exercises, you submit your answers, you can check out the community's answers, get feedback from mentors if you wanted to go that route. Uh, and there's different tracks for each language. We'll go through that in just a second. But to kick things off with the, the classic plugs, just wanna give a shout out to all the return visitors who've been joining us, all the people on YouTube who've subscribed. It's been really humbling to see people joining and getting excited, awesome comments. So if you're watching on YouTube, leave a comment, love to see it, happy to answer and reply. But tonight, we're gonna to be doing more Rust. I'm really enjoying it. Back at it now. This is about week three where I've been back at it. Took a little break, but we're here. We're about to learn. So if you're live right now on Twitch, feel free to hop in the chat, ask questions, happy to answer them, participate. If you're watching on YouTube after the fact and you wanna get involved live, we're live Tuesday nights, 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. Sometimes we go longer, sometimes we go shorter, but we usually start around 9 p.m. and I will update uh, if we ever decide to change or add another day or maybe I miss a week, I'll be posting on Twitter, so follow me there. But so yeah, let's do the uh, the classic plugs. Jude Machine, oh hey, finally caught one of your streams. Hell yeah, welcome to the chat. Uh, so Jude Machine said, I've started with Rust and your playlist on YouTube is helping me a lot. That's awesome, glad to hear it, and I'm, I'm really happy you're here live, so you're gonna experience it live now. So yeah, feel free, throw some stuff in the chat. Whenever you have questions, we're gonna go through it. And yeah, thank you for joining live, it's amazing. I love having people live because you can be part of the conversation, you're part of the stream, and you can watch later on YouTube if you want and see yourself uh, be active here. So first things first, the, the classic plugs. If you're on YouTube already, you know it, but if you're not, if you're watching on Twitch, here's the YouTube channel, check it out. We got some new videos, some new content recently. We did one on trying out Supabase, a backend as a service. We spun that up from a Google Sheet, created a basic Google Sheet, uploaded it, had a REST API, and we're just trying that out. And then in the next one we did, uh, we actually hit that API using Rust, leveraging the request library, which is the popular crate for Rust for making HTTP requests. We did some JSON deserialization, we structured our response, uh, and we worked with a, a cool API for getting some beers. So check that out. You can start with the, the Rust HTTP request one. And if you're interested on how we made the API for that, again, check out the one where we tried out Supabase, the Firebase alternative. Jewish Machine in the chat said, I'll probably just feel completely lost as I'm still in the first chapter of the book, but it's nice to be a part of it. Well, actually, you're joining at the perfect time because we're gonna be kind of doing, I don't wanna say like a refresher because we're doing different stuff, but we're using, today we're gonna be doing exorcism, which is going, we're going to go through some exercises and they're kind of like an introduction. So we'll probably move through them pretty quickly because we'll have experience with it having gone through the book, but we're going to pull down some exercises. The early ones are definitely geared towards beginners. We're going to work through them anyway, just to get, you know, I've been rusty because I've been out of, out of it for a little while, just took taking some time off and I'm trying to get back into it. So this is really going to help. And I'm sure as we get further into the exorcism exercises, they'll get a little bit more complicated. So perfect time to be joining in, even if you're new to Rust, uh, this is a great place to start. And maybe it's something you wanna try out yourself. Um, really quick before we get into that, follow on Twitter if you want updates for when I go live and when new content gets posted. Also, if you want updates on when new content gets posted, yo, best way to do that. Y'all already know it, subscribe to the channel. But yeah, so today we're gonna be using this thing exorcism.org. And again, I mentioned this to Juj Machine in the chat, but basically, if you want to get started with learning a language, this is a fantastic place to start. It's a CLI driven tool where you pull down exercises and you, you work on them. You submit your answers, you run it against tests, it gives you the tests, you, you write your code until the tests pass, then you submit your results. And then you can actually look at the community, what everyone else has submitted for their results, and then you can iterate on your, ex, your basically your code improve it a little bit and resubmit it. And then when you're done, you move on to the next exercise. And there's also even a track where you can get mentor help during those exercises. So if that's something you're interested in, this is a fantastic place. It used to be called exorcism.io. I've been using it for a while. You can see here, I've used it for some of the Elm stuff, Elixir stuff. I've done the closure track. I've done the Python track, started them. 
but today we're going to be doing the Rust track. So perfect time to jump in if you're new. And if you're returning, if you've already gone through the book, some of it will be a review, but still it's a nice way to get that muscle memory and keep learning and working with the Rust that we've been doing week after week. So I'm excited about it and we're going to get started. So before I start, I've already installed Exorcism, but if you're new and you're trying to set up Exorcism, uh, the way to do that is to just come to the, the main site, create an account, and it'll walk you through setting it up. But if you already have an account, you can always go here to getting started, and it shows you how to install Exorcism. And once you have it installed, it's basically a command line tool. And so you have your getting started here. It tells you all about it, tells you what mentoring is, um, how it's built. You can contribute because it's all open source. And then you have, I think down here, how to install it. So installing the CLI. I've already done this, uh, so we'll, we'll skip over it. It was a little more complicated for me because I'm running Ubuntu on Windows. But if you're running on a Mac or Windows machine, um, it's, not too, it's not too bad. You just download the CLI. It's pretty straightforward. And we'll use the CLI to pull down each exercise. So Juge Machine in the chat said, I've been slowly doing the rustling exercises. Yeah, awesome. The rustling exercises are great. We have a video uh, series on that as well. So if you want to check those out, those are some other exercises we did. We did those back. Oh, let me see if I can find it. Where did we do the wrestling ones? Somewhere in here. Ah, here, wrestling exercises. So we have a few uh, episodes on that. I think we did, yeah, four episodes on the wrestling exercises. So check those out if you're going through those. Clam Watson in the chat said, nice light. Yep. So this, I love this thing. This was a gift from my employer, Electric AI, for our hackathon. They sent us all these cool neon lights. I'm excited about it. I like it too because it's not like over the top corporate marketing or like, oh, we're not a corporate startup, but like it's not over the top, like here's my company. It's just as hack. It's got our, our logo, our lightning bolt. I love it. So thanks for the shout out, Clam. All right. So like I said, I already set it up. So what we're going to do is we're going to go over to the rest track. Now, before I do that, I want to show you what the tracks look like. So let's go to the tracks page here and you can see there's tracks for a bunch of different languages. You can see the ones I've started. I've started the JavaScript one, the Python one, Elixir, Rust, Elm, Clojure, but there's tracks for almost any language you can think of. And if there's not a track for it, you're probably learning some real bespoke language. So <laughs> good luck. But otherwise there's tracks for it. There's one for Vim. TypeScript is a popular one. Ruby has been pretty popular. Uh, Reason ML was popular for a while, maybe kind of waned a bit, but then you have stuff like Objective-C, OCaml, Lua, Kotlin's really popular with Android developers, so that's pretty cool. Haskell is pretty great if you're just trying to learn functional programming. Maybe you're not going to use it at work, but pretty cool anyway. Go is a very popular one. Erlang, of course, Elixir runs on the Erlang virtual machine, so Erlang's a great one for engineers looking to work with Elixir because you'll you'll frequently be reaching out to Erlang libraries to do stuff. And then some other stuff, closure script, Crystal. Crystal's kind of like, uh, kind of kind of fills the same space as Rust. It's going to be like a systems programming language that's as fast to see, but with the syntactic sugar of Ruby. So that's a cool one. I might check that out at some point. But today it's going to be all about the Rust one. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to click my Rust track, and it tells you, it gives you like this really nice UI, and it tells you kind of how to do everything. So it says in the first bit here, introduce yourself to Rust by completing Hello World. Very basic exercise. We're going to breeze through some of these early ones, but that's okay. Uh, we'll learn a bit. So let's get started. So we're going to hit go to the exercise, and here's the important bit. It's going to give you uh, the CLI command that you have to paste in your CLI to pull down the exercise, and it also gives the instructions. So this is a basic one, the classic introductory exercise. We're going to print Hello World to the screen. Of course, if you're familiar with Rust, we've done this. It's going to be easy. But let's learn how to use Exorcism. That's what we'll do with this first one. Not as much how to write the Rust code. That'll be very simple. We're going to instead kind of get some experience using Exorcism. And as we pull down more exercises, they'll get a little bit more complex. So we've already done the install Exorcism locally. We're going to go ahead, copy this command, and run it over here. So I'm just going to paste it in. Oh, my Exorcism command is not found. Let me see where is Exorcism. I thought I said sub. It's probably my path somewhere. Give me one second. I definitely have it. Give me a second. Let's see. Let's see. Let's clear this out. Classic live stream incidents here. All right. Hold on. Let's see. 
Let's go to the instructions really quick. Make sure I did everything correct. We're on Linux. We used snap. All right, let's see. Let's try running this really quick. All right, no worries. I definitely have it. I have the tar, the file here. So let me just go ahead and run through that. Install via source code. I know my process architecture. I've already downloaded it. Okay, great. So I should have this already. Let me just see that I have that. So there's exorcism. All right, so I already have it. Let's try running it from there. And then we just need to add it to our path. I think that's all that I need to do. Great. So I already have it. I just need to add it to my path. So for that, I can do this. Let's do this. Ah, it's because it's in my bash profile, but I haven't sourced it. That's probably why. All right, we're good. So now we have it. Follow the instructions if you don't have it. Okay, so basically I have it in my bash profile, but I need to, I'm not sourcing my bash profile because I'm using um, ZSH. So I want to add it to my ZSH profile. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to copy that command and I'm going to go ahead and add it to my ZSHRC. And same thing here, I'm going to just source my ZSHRC. And now I'll have it every time I start my terminal. Oh, no such, that's okay. That's for my ZSHRC. So exorcism is there. Great, now I can paste this command for installing the Rust track. Let's go back here. I like this little wizard art. That's pretty cool. I feel like a wizard. All right, copy that. Let's go here, paste that. Awesome, so it's downloading that Hello World exercise. And you're gonna see what it's gonna do is it's gonna download a cargo project. And then it's gonna have the tests. And so the tests are going to actually test that it outputs hello world. And so what we'll do is we'll start out by running the test. They'll fail. We'll make our code change, run the test again. As soon as they pass, we'll refactor the code if we need to. Hello world, we're not gonna need to. And then we'll submit it. And then we'll be able to see the community's um, solutions and other folks in the community. And you can see which ones are rated very highly and you can compare it. Sometimes people have very clever solutions. So that should be pretty cool. All right, so now I can go out of here. And now I have an exorcism folder. And you can see I have a Rust folder, so I'm going to go into my Rust folder. And there's my Hello World, so I'm going to open that. And we'll see a README with instructions, and we'll also see the tests. They'll be in the test folder. They don't put them in the same file. They'll be in the test folder, and then we'll have our code. So like I said, we'll run cargo test. Yes, I trust the authors. <coughs> All right. So let's look at the README first. It's pretty straightforward. Hello World. Instructions, the classical introductory exercise, we're going to just have it say hello world. The objectives are simple. Write a function that returns a string, hello world. Run the test suite and make sure that it succeeds. Submit your solution and check it out at the website. All right, so first we're going to try running cargo test. And it failed. Uh, well, actually, in this case, it failed to parse my manifest. Let's see why. The package requires the cargo feature called edition 2021, but that feature is not stabilized in this version of cargo. Consider trying a newer version of cargo. So I'm just going to do rust up update and that should update cargo rust. You can see everything that it's updating. So if you're ever out of date, it's always good. If you haven't done anything in a while with, with the language to just run rust up update and it'll update all that stuff. So let's run this update get the latest versions of things. So we're going to get the latest version of Clippy, Cargo. You can see Rust Analysis, Rust Source. So it's going to help us in general because it also help our editor um, with Rust Analyzer work better. All right, so let me clear this out. Let me lower this so it's less intrusive. And let's run Cargo Test. Great, so that's working. And our test failed because, of course, right now it says it expected Hello World, but it got Goodbye Mars. So what we're going to edit is our lib. And you can see, very basic, if you've been following along, you know Rust, Clam Watts in the chat, programming, all right, absolutely. You can see here that we have our public hello function. We're not using a main RS, we're using a library, a lib RS. So you can see that we have our public function hello. It's gonna return a string. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and change it to hello world. Hello, comma, 
world. Save that, run our test. And there we go, test pass. I don't think there's any way we can optimize this. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna submit it. And so the way that you do that is if you go back to your exorcism there, you have your instruction set. I think actually it's also in the readme where it is to submit it. Uh, maybe it put, should have put it in the output. Let's see. Exorcism. Maybe it's exorcism submit. Ah, yeah. So we do submit and then the name of the file. So in our case, source lib. All right. So it says your solution has been submitted successfully. View it at exorcism.org tracks for us. Hello world. So let's go ahead and click that. I'll pull that up over here. And there, so you see that we've submitted it. And now what we can do is go, oh, sorry, it opened it up in the wrong page. Let me just go back over here, refresh this. We're gonna see that it was submitted. So it says, nice, it looks like you're all done here. And it also tells you your solution looks good. It does a little analysis. It says, good job, your solution to Hello World has passed all the tests. So we have a passed and we can mark it as complete. Now, it gives you an option. Uh, we could share our solution with the community and you have two options. You can share a single iteration because we might want to iterate on it, or we can share all iterations. In this case, we're not going to be doing another iteration. So I'm just going to share all iterations. And now you can actually follow me on exorcism.org, Tom McGurl, and you can see my results. So now that we're done with Hello World, it's going to open up all of the other exercises to us. Now, the cool thing about exorcism.org is there is a guided track for some languages, not all of them, at least when I last used it, not all of them had this but some of them have a guided curriculum, which is really cool. Now you can do any exercise you want if you wanna challenge yourself, but what the guided curriculum does, is similar to the book, is it introduces you to different concepts through the exercise. So we're gonna try that. So we're gonna go through the syllabus, and now you can see we have our journey through Rust. We completed Hello World, that's the first gate, and now we're into the syllabus. So it'll start with functions. Once we've completed functions, we'll get access to enums, floating point numbers, and integers. And once we complete those, we'll get access to the other um, exercise. And you can see how they're linked. So this is really, really cool. And I'm excited about this because this wasn't here when I first tried exorcism. And I think it's pretty awesome. So let's try it out. Let's start out with functions. Actually, before we do that, let me see if we can. Uh, they might not do it with Hello World. But once we're done with the other ones, we'll be able to see other people's solutions. So let's start out with functions. OK, so here's the exercise. It tells you a little bit about functions. We're familiar with them. If you've been, again, following along, we're familiar with them, but let's read through it anyway. So sometimes a certain piece of code needs to be used more than once. If that's the case, it might be convenient to put the code into a function. A function generally only performs one specific action. In Rust, the function keyword is used to define functions. We've seen that. The code belongs to the function is always between brackets and the function gets a name, right? So. Here is the exercise for learning functions. This one's called Lucian's, let me zoom in a little bit. It's probably pretty small. Lucian's Luscious Lasagna. All right, so we click that. It's gonna take us to our exercise and let's quickly read the instructions and then we'll clone it. So in this exercise, we're gonna write some code to help you cook a brilliant lasagna from your favorite cooking book. You have four tasks. All are related to the time spent cooking lasagna. So the first task is to define the expected oven time in minutes. Define the expected minutes in oven binding to check how many minutes the lasagna should be in the oven. According to the cooking book, the expected oven time in minutes is 40. Okay, so we have expected oven time in minutes. It needs to return 40. Next, we're going to calculate the remaining oven time in minutes. So we're going to define a function called remaining oven time in minutes, or remaining minutes in oven, and should take the actual minutes the lasagna has been in the oven as a parameter and return how many minutes it has left, how many more minutes it should remain in the oven. So we could probably leverage our expected minutes in oven function for that. Next, we want to calculate the preparation time minutes. So we're going to define a function that takes the number of layers you added to the lasagna ooh, as a parameter and returns how many minutes you spend preparing the lasagna, assuming each layer takes you two minutes to prepare. Pretty cool. I want a lasagna with like, I don't want too many layers. You know what I'm saying? I want like, I feel like my, my ideal lasagna is like, six layers. I don't know. What do you think? 
I haven't really thought. I haven't thought too much about it. Anyway, back on track. Calculate the elapsed time in minutes. So we need to define elapsed time in minutes function that takes two parameters. The first parameter is the number of layers we added to the lasagna, ideally six in my case. And the second parameter is the number of minutes the lasagna has been in the oven. The function returns how many minutes you've worked on cooking the lasagna, which is the sum of the preparation time in minutes and the time in minutes the lasagna is spent in the oven at that moment. Now, these instructions, we're going to work through them, but what we're really going to do is we're going to look at the tests and we're going to try to, to make it work for the tests. Clam Watson in the chat says, give me the gabagool. Give me the gabagool. Are you putting gabagool in your lasagna? Maybe. I know ground beef or like meatball, like mini meatball. Some people put egg. Depends on the kind. You can make any kind of lasagna. All right. Anyway, let's do this. Let's copy this. Let's go back to our editor here. Paste it. It's going to download that exercise. Once that's done, we'll have a new folder. It is a wild idea. It's a powerful cane. All right. So let's see. We have our Lucian's Luscious Lasagna. The alliteration there is it's pretty good. All right. So we're going to open that up. And what I'm going to do first, I'm going to run the test. Before I run the test, I'm going to look at the tests. So let's look at the tests. So the tests we have, a few of them are ignored. So we'll unignore those when we want to test them. Let's tackle one at a time. So first, you'll notice this. This is just, if you're familiar with Rust, it's familiar. But just for the folks that aren't, or you know, Exorcism, I don't know if it explains this portion of it, because it doesn't go too much into how the tests work. But I think it's pretty cool. This is just importing from our library the proper functions. So we're going to define these functions, and that's how it's able to use them. And so the first one is it's simply expecting that expected minutes in oven returns 40. And if I run that test using cargo test, it's going to fail because it hasn't been implemented. And so you can see here expected minutes in oven is correct. Zero passed, one failed. And you can see here uh, it failed. And if you want to look into why it failed, it's because it probably doesn't do anything. So let's look at our source. So there's our expected minutes in oven. And you can see it's marked with unimplemented. Now, the reason for that is Rust, again, is a compiled language, right? It's a safely compiled language. And so what this is doing is it's letting it pass the compiler so that we could properly run the tests. If it didn't pass the compiler, we wouldn't even get to the tests because what would happen was the compiler would complain. So unimplemented is a way for us to denote that something hasn't been implemented, but it should pass the compiler and be ignored. We also have this here that marks that we should allow unused functions. None of these functions, not all of them may be used, right? And that's because we're not using it within our library. We're only using it within our tests. So this is just saying, hey, allow these to not be used within the library, but we are using them with our tests. So that's what that's for. OK, so unimplemented, expecting minutes in oven. Well, we know based on our tests that that should be 40. So this one should be really easy. We're just going to go ahead and return 40. And if you need an extra hint, we know that this needs to return a signed 32-bit integer. And we're leaving off the semicolon because we have implicit returns. So we'll just put 40 here. Let's clear this out and run cargo test. And there we go. Our test passes. OK, great. But now we have a few other things we need to test. So let's go ahead and remove some of these ignores. Uh, let's start with the ones that are, let's start one at a time. Let's start with this one, remaining minutes in oven. Let's get rid of this ignore. Let's run our test. It should fail. All right, great. It fails. And now let's code this one. So remaining minutes in oven is going to, it's calling remaining minutes in oven with 25 and it's, it's expecting 15 be returned. And that's because if you've given it 25 minutes, remember we know that the parameter is how many minutes have elapsed. If we've given it 25 minutes uh, and the total number of minutes is 40 and you subtract 25 from 40, you get 15, right? So that's what we need to do there. So we need to code remaining minutes in oven. So let's go there. You can see here, remaining minutes in oven takes the actual minutes in oven and has unimplemented. Uh, calculate remaining minutes in oven given actual minutes in oven. Now, this is cool. So we talked about unimplemented being, hey, let it compile, being unimplemented. But look at this. They're actually leaving a note for the developer. So if you're working on a team, right, and you're working with Rust code, and you have a function you know you want to write, but you haven't yet coded it, if you're doing test-driven development, which we're doing right now, right? We didn't write the tests. Yeah. 
somebody else wrote them, but we're doing TDD, right? We have our tests, we're testing, coding, refactoring. This is a great way to say, hey, I wrote my test. Here's what this thing should do. It's unimplemented, but here's what it needs to do. So really cool stuff. Um, I would love to see things like this in other languages because I think it's pretty cool. Of course, in this case, we use it because of the compiler. So what are we going to do? Well, we need to return a sign 32-bit integer. And basically, we can get the expected minutes in oven by just calling the function. Now, we could hard code 40, but there's a problem with that, right? What if the lasagna recipe changes and the expected minutes in oven is different? Uh, maybe it's 30 minutes for like a soggy lasagna. Maybe you want to overcook that, make the crispy gabagool lasagna that Clam Watson in the chat's trying to make. If you're trying to make the crispy gabagool lasagna, you might need a whole hour. Now, we don't want to hard code things because then it's not scalable, right? So we want to have this constant, or in this case, this function that returns the value. And so if we change it later, we just change this, and then we don't have to change all the other functions that rely on it. So we're going to do expected minutes in oven minus the actual minutes it's been in the oven. And that's it. Let's run it. Run our test. We're good. Do we need to refactor? No, I don't think there's anything really we can clean up there. I think that's pretty good. And it, it's readable, right? Um, if we did, if we flipped it, right, we did actual minutes in oven, actual minutes in oven plus minus expected minutes in oven, it might not be as readable. Here it's very readable. Expected minutes in the oven minus how long it's been in the oven. Pretty straightforward. All right, so let's move on. So the next one, there's a few tests for. Uh, there's two. Preparation time in minutes. So let's ignore both. Let's remove both of those. Let's run our test, which should fail. And I like to run my tests first and have them fail in typical TDD style, right? We're writing the test, having it fail, making it pass, refactoring. We're all good. So here, let's see. So we see that both of these functions failed, right? So let's take a look. It says here that it failed because it's not implemented, which is, is obvious, right? But let's take a look at what it's expecting. So preparation time in minutes, it should be however many layers. Each layer takes two minutes. So if each layer takes two minutes, if we give one layer, our minutes should be two. If we give four, it should be eight, right? So we're just taking the number of layers multiplied by the minutes. Jimmy Joe MC is now following, yes. For those that don't know, low key secret for those in the chat, that's my brother. What is up? Glad to have you here. Juge Machine in the chat said, one thing you can also do is add a parameter in expected minutes in oven, and then just return the parameter. So yeah, expected minutes in oven, we could just have it be a constant, right? Or an, an enum in Rust, we would have an enumeration that just has a constant value for that. But the benefit of calling the function is that later, if that value becomes computed in some way, right? Maybe elapsed time in, in oven is dependent on other inputs, we could add inputs and have that function return an output, right? A pure function, it could take, maybe the last time minutes takes your altitude, right? So we know that ovens can vary in, if you're in a high altitude, right? It might take different time to cook than if you're cooking down low, right? So there's a lot of opportunities there. I think in this case, we're just testing functions. That's why they did it. But welcome to the chat, Jimmy Joe. Glad to have you here. All right, so we just ignored, we unignored these. So now we know that we need to take the number of layers multiplied by two. So let's go to our lib. Preparation time minutes takes number of layers, which is a signed 32-bit integer. And again, we have to calculate the preparation time minutes for number of layers. So this is basic. We know how to do it. It's going to be the number of layers times two. Let's run our test. There we go. Test pass. Awesome. On the next one. So for the next one, we need to calculate uh, elapsed time in minutes. And so there's two tests. Uh, elapsed time in minutes, we have 1 and 30. So let's see what the definition is of the function. So the first argument is the number of layers. The second argument is the actual minutes in oven. So we need to calculate the elapsed time in minutes for the number of layers and actual minutes in oven. Right? So let's look at what it's looking for. Let's go here. So the last time in minutes, uh, the first test is giving it 1 and 30. So we know that one layer takes two minutes. 30 is 32. Four layers, each layer takes two minutes. Four times two is eight. 
a plus 8 is 16. So we know we're multiplying the first one by 2. We already have a function that does that. We're going to use that. And then we're just adding the second argument. So pretty easy. So, and that's the cool thing about test-driven development is because you can put your tests, and maybe you'd have more tests, right? Maybe you'd test other weird inputs, like negative inputs, um, things like that, right? Maybe we would say, in fact, in this case, they're using so, you know, sine 32 bit integers. Maybe we'd use unsigned because we're never really dealing with negative values. But anyway, for the sake of this thing, let's just do what we got to do. So we're going to do number of layers plus the actual time minutes. So to get the number of the preparation time for those layers, let's call our existing function. Preparation time in minutes for number of layers plus actual time in oven. Leave off the semicolon for the implicit return and run our test. Oh, let me make sure I remove that ignore. I did not because it, I saw that it only ran four tests. I know we have six. There we go. All of them passed. So now what we would do in tr traditional test-driven development fashion is we'd go back and we'd refactor as needed. There's not really much to refactor. This is very basic stuff. So we're going to not. Um, so what we'll do is we'll submit it. So to submit it, we're going to do exorcism submit lib. Go back to our luscious lasagna page here. Oh. And here we go. Nice. Looks like you're all done. And it says here, your solution passed test, and they don't have any recommendations. Pfft, of course not. <laughs> what? what would they even, what would they, what would they tell us? They did perfect, right? All right, so we passed. We're going to mark as complete, and we'll share our results. Again, if you're doing this and you're not comfortable sharing your results, you don't have to. You're not gate kept from seeing the other folks' solutions by only submitting your results. If you don't feel comfortable, don't submit them. You can still view other solutions, and you can still iterate and update your code. So we'll do that now. We'll just take a look just to see what other folks have done. But before we do that, it says here we've completed Lucian's Luscious Lasagna. We learned one concept and unlocked two exercises. So next up, we have a few different exercises we can go through. And here they are, assembly line and semi-structured logs. But before we do that, let's return to the exercise. I just want to show you one cool thing. So we can see our iterations. This is our code. And we can see the community solutions. So we go here, and they're kind of sorted by like the number of stars that they get, right? So let's look at this one. This one has one star. Uh, it's probably pretty recent, two months ago. Let's see how they did it, if they did it any differently. So same thing we had, right? Same exact thing. Here's another one. Same thing. So yeah, this is pretty basic. I don't think we'll see too much variation. I think as we get more into some more advanced exercises, we'll see some more variation. But for now, it's going to be pretty much the same because they're relatively simple. All right, so let's go back to our concepts in the syllabus here. All right, so now we have enum basics, floating point numbers, and integers. Let's do enums basic. Semi-structured logs. All right, enums, short for enumerations, which we talked about just recently with Jewish Machine. We could have used an enum for the, the time, right, that it took. But they wanted to introduce this concept later, so we're going to do it now. Uh, they're a type that limit all possible values of some data. The possible values of an enum are called variants. Enums also work well with match and other control flow operators to help you express intent in your Rust programs. Cool. Let's go to semi-structured logs. All right, let's see what we're doing here. So in this exercise, we'll be generating semi-structured log messages. What does that mean? A log message is, if you're familiar with log, it's when you log something. A structured log is usually some log that has an intent to it, whether it's a warning, an error, um, information. If you're familiar with Python, you probably use the logger, which has different levels like info warn. If you're familiar with JavaScript, you might have console.error, console.log, console.dir. Same thing, right? Those are structured logs. So here we go. So emit semi-structured messages. You'll start with some stub functions and the following enum. So they're going to give us this. Our enum has log level, and these are the three different values. Now check this out. Uh, we don't really need to go into it, but just because I think it's kind of cool, and we're familiar with this if you've gone through the Rust book. So here, what we're saying is this thing implements clone, which means basically that it will clone a value. So it's if you're familiar with JavaScript, it's copied by value, right? It's not going to, when you use this, you're not going to take ownership of it. 
partial equality, that means we can compare it. So we'll be able to compare log levels. We can compare them. They have partial equality. And debug means we can print it with the debug formatter. That's all. So your goal is to emit a log message as follows. Level message. So you'll need to implement functions that correspond with the log levels. For example, the below snippet demonstrates an expected output for the log function. Log, log error, stack overflow. So if, if someone calls your log function with the log level error, which again, log level error, that's the item, it should print out bracket error, bracket, colon, and your message. For info, it should do the same thing, but with bracket info, bracket, colon, the message. Um, and then there's optional further practice. This is a cool feature of Rust's testing library. So this is called a feature-gated test. We saw this a little bit in the book. Feature-gated tests disable compilation entirely for certain sections of your program. They will be covered later. For now, just know that there is a test which is only built and run when you use a special testing invocation. So we'll try that out. All right, so let's get started. Let's clone this. Let's go back here. Let's go up a level. Download that. All right, so there we go. Semi-structured logs. Let's open that up. Oh. And we will take a look at the tests just briefly. So everything is ignored except for this test. Um, it's asserting that if you call info with this message, it prints out info with this message. All right, perfect. And then we'll slowly do these ones. So let's run the cargo test just to show that it fails. So it says here, um, thread emits info panic at not implemented. So it's not implemented. So we should expect to see a unimplemented function. And that's what we see for info. So again, we're testing this one info. So let's code that one up. And let's, let's do a little bit of TDD here. Now, we might refactor, but let's make the test pass. Once the test passes, we'll refactor. We'll get the test to pass, we'll refactor. And the beauty of that is you know that if your tests are there and they're failing and you write some code and they pass and you refactor, if at all they break, you know your refactor broke them. But if you're able to refactor, you can lean against those tests, right? That's the beauty of tests. So let's implement info. So for info, it's gonna be pretty straightforward. We have a string. So what we'll do is we'll do a format and we'll do in this case, we'll just hard code info for now because we know, again, we just want this test to pass info. And then the thing we need to include is the message. All right, so what are we doing here? We're formatting a string. Info, we have our brackets. It's going to put the message in place of those brackets. Let's give it a run. Oh, and again, don't forget format is going to return a string, capital S string. So we're given a string slice, but we're going to return a string and that will do that. So let's go ahead and run it. All right, our test passed. Awesome. Let's move on to the next test. Let's unignore it. So here we have to do the same thing for warning. And while we're at it, I can see we're going to do the same thing for um, error. So I'm going to also just uncomment error. Might as well just tackle them both. They look pretty similar. Uh, before I do that, of course, I'm going to run my test just to make sure those two fail. One passed, two failed, three ignored. Good. Let's go here. Let's write those. So let's do warn first. So warn is going to be basically the same thing, except we need, if you look at the test, we need it to print out warning. So we'll do that. So we'll go here, warning, nothing there. And then the same thing for error. Error is going to be the same thing, but we're going to print out error. Run our tests. Come on. Passed. Of course. Awesome. Okay. And I, I think I'm already seeing I'm already seeing some potential for refactoring. You want me to should I just go into it? Should I tell you what I'm thinking? Okay. Let's wait till we do log, but let me just kind of talk about what I'm thinking in case it ends up being totally nonsense. I'm thinking we can derive these strings from their log level, right? We could do log level warning uppercase. 
That's what, that's what I'm thinking. We'll see. We'll see. Let's go with log first. We'll see what we can do. We're going to make the test pass, and again, we'll refactor after. We'll do some real TDD. All right, so log emits info. So here's the thing. So with log function, it, they're asserting that if they pass to the log function the level, it should print out the proper thing, right? And look, there's another one. If they pass a log level warning, they want to print out a warning. So we can use our functions, right? We can just use our functions. Oh, and this one's behind a gate. We'll get to that later. That's what this is doing. We're, this, we're clearly going to use our functions. So what we need to do is we need to take a log level. Based on the log level, print the appropriate thing. So let's just do that. So first, let's go ahead and uncomment those tests. Beautiful. We're not going to uncomment this one. We'll come back to that. Let's go ahead and make this work. So our log is going to take, oh, sorry, before we do that, again, I just want to run the test to show that three fail. Perfect, three fail. It shows you which ones fail. Now let's get those to pass. Then we'll refactor. Fail, pass, refactor, pass. That's the, that's the objective. So what we can do here is we can call our functions, but first we need to do a match on the log level, right? So we could do something like match, our match expression, and if you didn't know this i know it because i read the book that's the readme is here to help you with that so the readme has some information it has some hints there's some help it has some hints it tells you about using match operators there's some help here you can use so i'm good i think i'm good on reading that they did mention the the match in if you remember here uh they mentioned it somewhere match yeah so they mentioned you can use match i'm familiar with it so i'm going to use it i'm going to match on the level and so what you have to do here is you would do a case for each one so we'll do log level info and then the code for what you want to do for info and in our case we want to just call info with the message what is this saying missing match arm okay it's because it's saying we haven't handled all the log levels so let's keep going copy that all right so we need one for error or sorry we'll do warn next warning we'll call warn and we need one for error And look, it stopped complaining because we've solved all of the possible things. We don't even need a fallback, right? We don't even need this. I don't know if you've seen this. We don't need this because it's never going to not match because we're using enum. Ah, so Juju Machine said, managed to figure it out, but forgot the log level. Yeah, so the log level, we're going to use the log level enum and call the appropriate one. So here's what we're doing. Let's break it down. We're going to match on level. If the log level is info, it's going to call info message. If it's warning, it's going to call warn message. If it's error, it's going to call error message. So pretty straightforward. Let's go ahead and run our tests. And we're good. We passed. Now, before I make any changes, I want to try running this other test, the special gated test, right? Let's try running that and see what happens. So. To run that, first we're going to have to unignore it. And then we need to call this feature. And the reason it's buying a feature is it's it's not trying to compile. Let me be clear. By putting it that it's behind a feature flag, it's not going to look for log level debug. This doesn't exist. So this wouldn't even this test wouldn't even compile if we didn't put that. Um, so we're putting it behind a feature flag so that when we do call it with that feature flag, we're going to see a compilation error. And that's exactly what we're going to do. If you see, the readme tells you how to run that test. So we're going to do that. So we're going to do cargo test features dash dash features add a variant. And you're going to see we're going to fail to compile. Beautiful. We don't compile. Why don't we compile? Well, because debug isn't associated with logger. There's no log level debug. So we need to add that. So let's go ahead and add that. We're going to add it to our enum, right? And then similar to what we have down here, we're going to add another function for it. 
debug message and it's going to log debug with the message. Now, check this out. This is why Rust is great, right? This is why typed languages are great. It's complaining. Why is it complaining? It tells us that we haven't handled all the cases. Look, non-exhaustive patterns. Debug is not covered. Ensure that all possible cases are being handled. So it says possibly by adding a wildcard or more match arms. We could add a wildcard that would accept everything else, but we know that the only other option is debug. So it's more explicit to say, hey, when you have debug, just call debug. There we go. Stop complaining. And now let's rerun that command. Beautiful. All tests pass. So we could just be done here. But let's leverage that test-driven development. Let's refactor our code, if we can, and see those tests pass. So one thing I want to call out right away, one thing that stands out to me is the hard-coded strings. Now, why does it stand out? Well, because these strings look like this enum. So maybe we can derive those strings from the enum and eliminate those hard-coded strings. Why do I want to do that? Why does that matter? In this case, not it doesn't really matter that much. Right, it's a it's a pretty small API surface. There's only a few functions. It's passing the test. We could just move on, but we kind of want to experiment a little bit. And I think we can make this even more robust, right? Because right now, what's going to happen is if we add another log level, we need to add another function. You just saw it for debug. We added debug. We had to add a function. We had to add a match arm. I think we can make it easier for future engineers to come in and add another level and have it just kind of work, right? So let's think about that. What if, let's try something. Instead of matching, what if we took the log level, converted it to uppercase, then did a string format with the log level in the message? What do I mean by that? Let's do this, watch. Let, um, level indicator equal level dot to uppercase, I think it is. It's going to let us do that. To uppercase, let me just see. So level is a log level to uppercase. Let's see if this works. And then what we would do is we would return format. bracket, colon, and then the message. And so we would pass it level indicator, which if we hover, it's saying it's unknown. So let's see, this might not work. Let's try it out. Let's try it out. It's worth a shot. Message. And now it will complain if it's not. OK, so it did complain. No method to uppercase found for enum log level in current scope. So maybe we just need to convert this to a string. So what if we did, let's see, how can we convert this to a string? I believe, well, there's a few ways. We could probably format it, but that doesn't feel right. Let's see if we can just do something like this to cast it to a string. No, nope, it's not gonna like that. So let's see, how can we convert our level, our enum to a string? Maybe there's a two string function. Let's see. Sometimes parse will work. OK, so no method parse. So let's Google it. Convert Rust enum to string, right? So let's see. Probably the easiest way we'd implement display. So we would implement display for that enum, I think. We could do that. I feel like there was an easier way to do that. Let's see. Yeah, so it looks like what we can do is format it, which is what I was thinking we could do. So that might be a good option. Let's see, Rust users, convert enum to string. So yeah, so there's derive, converting enum to string and vice versa, Rust. Let's see what this says. Might be overkill, might be overkill. 
let's see. So there's a crate for it. Eh, we don't want to pull a new crate into our exercise. That seems like overkill. Let's see, convert. Strum, yeah, that's the other one. Okay, well, strum seems intense. What if we did, what if we just formatted it? Let's try something. What if we did log level indicator equals, let's try formatting it, see if that works. Because it already has debug on it and clone on it. What if we did formats level? What is that saying? Log level doesn't implement standard format display. The trait standard format display is not implemented for log level. In format strings, you may be able to use, ah, colon question mark. So let's try that. That'll actually format it like, ah, so actually we could probably, we have level indicator now, so we're, we're actually formatting it. So that could work. And then what we would probably want to do is just to uppercase that, which should now work because it's a string. All right, we have a string. So this should work. We didn't have to pull in a, a, lot, a crate. So now what I've done here is level indicator. I formatted level into a string using its the fact that it has a debug trait. And I've two uppercased it. So now I should have info all caps, warning all caps, error all caps, debug all caps. And then I'm returning it. So now what this does for me is I can, instead of hard coding here, I can just call log for each of these with a hard coded log level. So what I mean by that is, let me comment this out. I could just do log, pass it the log level, in this case info, and pass it the message. And now I can do the same thing for this, the same thing for this, and the same thing for this. Here, again, we'd be doing warning. Here we'd be doing error. And of course here, debug. Now, what does this do? Okay, yeah, we cut a few lines of code, but that's not the important part. Juge Machine in the chat says, wait, doesn't that mean you only need one function now? Well, not necessarily because our tests are explicitly testing for the presence of an info function, a warn function, an error function. We do need to, to maintain what I call the API surface. So we do need to maintain the API of having an info, a warn, an error. Otherwise, we'd have a breaking change, right? Our tests are expecting these. We don't have them, they wouldn't pass. So they're still expecting these, but what we are doing is calling a single function. And yes, in theory, you could just have the one, absolutely. But now what we're doing is we're leveraging just that one function and we're not hard coding anything, which is really cool. So again, this is all in theory, let's test it and see if it's actually gonna work. Let's clear it out. I think it is. Bam, our test pass. So what does that mean? It means we can get rid of this extra code that we have commented out. Save it, run our test again, just to be safe and awesome. Choose machine in the chat said, not gonna lie, that's genuinely cool. Yes, yeah, I mean, this is test-driven development. That's the great part, right? We've modified our code and our tests still pass, so we know we're good. Like That's the benefit of getting those tests to pass first before you do any kind of refactoring. You have that safety harness. And yeah, now we're not hard coding anything. We're calling a single function. It's shorter, right? We don't have the big match statement. Jimmy Joe in the chat says, even I'm enjoying this. Any loggers in the chat, like actual like like, like hacks loggers? So yeah, pretty cool. So now we've restructured our code. It passed the test. We're good. I'm confident this is a pretty cool solution. So I'm gonna go ahead and exorcism submit and submit this. All right, let's go over to our thing here. And we we didn't end up having to pull in a crate. I was a little worried we we're gonna have to pull in a crate. And I was like, I don't wanna pull in a crate. Not for these, you shouldn't have to. That's the whole idea with exorcism is you shouldn't have to pull in extra crates and stuff. They give you kind of the tools you, you should be able to leverage. All right, solution passed and they don't have any recommendations. It's pretty cool, I'm gonna cry. All right, before I mark it as complete though, I wanna see what other people did. So let's take a look. Let's see how other people solved it. It's 26 stars, 29, oh, two stars. All right, let's check this one out. 
Let's go. They did the base. They did the same thing. Awesome. So they have the same thing. They didn't implement debug, but that's cool. Uh, it wasn't a requirement, but yeah, we implemented debug, but yeah, they did the same thing. So that's really cool. So no hard coded strings. Let's take a look at somebody else. Oh, they're pulling in standard format. Oh, I like this. Okay. So here they're using the one from that we saw on Google, right? Where you format the enum. So what they're doing is they're pulling in standard format. Then they're calling a function format, passing it a formatter. A formatter is a function that tells you how to format something, obviously. Not obvious, maybe, I don't know. And returns a result. And they match on that. That's pretty cool. So if if um, if the formatter is info, it writes this. If it's warning, it writes this. And then they're just calling log. That's pretty cool. The cool thing about it is, check it out. Um, they've implemented the display formatter for log level. We used the debug one to, get, to kind of cheat it. But they actually implemented their own display. That's pretty sweet. I like that solution. But I like ours too. What is Rust used for? So great question. Uh, Rust is a systems programming language. What it is used for is to do stuff uh, on your system. What does that mean? Basically, anything you would normally write um, like a script for or to do something on a machine, like on your code, you'd write maybe like a Python script or a, a JavaScript script. You could replace that with Rust. And the benefits of Rust is it's way, way faster. It's way safer. So you're not going to end up accidentally doing stuff. There's not going to be memory leaks. It's for doing writing programs. Like that's just the scripting use case, but it's really for writing programs that are safe and fast. And so anything that you would previously have used C for, you can write a web server in Rust. You can really do anything with Rust. And also the cool thing about Rust is it can compile to WebAssembly, which can run in browsers. So if you wanted to write code for a browser, you are not limited to JavaScript anymore. You can use Rust. A lot of folks use Rust for applications on the web to offload intense tasks. So JavaScript is not very fast. So if you had to compute some mathematical operations or you need to maybe parse a, a list and do some transformations, you could offload that to Rust. It'll do it very quickly and very safely and return the result. So it's, it's a very good language. People say it's closer to the metal, which just means it's a lower level language. You can really get into the memory, um, but it's the main things are it's fast and safe. So really, really cool. And the reason I started my Rust adventure was to have a systems programming language in my tool belt that wasn't C. I'm not a fan of C. It's very difficult for me to use. I feel like it's easy for me to write bad or unsafe C code. With Rust, they make that very hard. And Rust is a much better, I think, tool chain with cargo and stuff. All right. Let's mark it as complete. We'll share our iterations. And let's move on. All right. So we completed semi structure logs. Uh, we're one step closer to learning Rust. Pfft, they don't know that we already learned it. That's cool, though. I'm having fun. This is cool. I haven't, we didn't get to do this stuff like in the book, so I like it. All right, show me more concepts. Let's do, let's do floating point numbers. Floating point numbers, numbers with decimals, right? You can see them here. And we know that Rust has many different types of numbers, right? They have signed integers, negative one, one. Unsigned integers only positives, zero to infinity. Floating point F64, 64-bit floats. They have F32s, right? So by default, floating points default to F64s. We know that from the book. Let's take a look at this exercise. So this exercise is called assembly line. We have a picture of a robotic arm hovering over a car. All right, so what are we gonna be doing? In this exercise, we're gonna be writing code to analyze the production of an assembly line in a car factory. The assembly line speed can, speed can range from zero, which is off, to a maximum of 10 hyperspeed, G-fueled. At its lowest speed, one, 221 cars are produced each hour. The production increases linearly with the speed. Okay, so one to one, linear. So with the speed set to four, it should produce four times 221 per hour. However, higher speeds increase the likelihood that faulty cars are produced which then have to be discarded. The following table shows how speed influences success rate. So, I mean, it doesn't then really increase linearly, right? I guess the production does, but there's a chance that it's faulty. Okay, so like quality control, right? So as you get faster, there's a more likelihood of failure rate. And so here they have that written out here on a table. So from one to four, it's got 100% success rate. So obviously if we're running a business, we're gonna run it at four. 
right? Maybe not. Maybe we were worth sacrificing that card. Depends on how much they cost. But one to four hundred percent, five to eight, you're running in that ninety percent rate. And you start trying to crank it up to, to G fuel speeds, and you're getting seventy seven percent success rate. We have two tasks. So one is to implement a method to calculate the assembly line's production rate per hour, taking into account its success rate. So we're going to be given a speed, I think. And given the speed, calculate its rate. So one to four, we're just going to return 221 times that. Five to eight, we're going to return 221 times 0.9, right? We're going to return speed times 220, speed times 221 times 0.9. 9 to 10, we're going to return 9 or 10, whatever they pass in, times 221 times 0.77, because it's going to have that success rate. Next, we're going to calculate the number of working items produced per minute. That's interesting. Implement a method to calculate how many working cars are produced per minute. OK, so for 6, 6 falls within the 90% rate. Divide that by 60. I guess that's what we're doing. All right, I think the cool thing here that they're going to have us mess with is the return value. So they say here the return value is a float, but the return value here is an unsigned 32-bit integer. So we're going to be doing some cool conversions. Jimmy Joe, yeah, absolutely. Uh, feel free to watch this on YouTube after, or since you're my brother, you could just come over. I can show you it. But you get VIP status. Thanks for hopping by. Appreciate it. Love you. All right. Next up is this one. Let's pull it down. So we're going to copy it. Go over here. Why do I have so many things open? Oh, I'm going to close out these old ones. Hold on. We don't need them. All right, there we go. Paste it. Assembly line. I'm excited for this. What time are we at? How much time we got? Oh, we're cruising. We're cruising. All right, we'll do this one. We'll see where we end up. Maybe we'll do one more or we'll call it. Let's see where we end up. All right, so semi structured logs. So let's do this. Let's uh, open that up. Sorry, no. So we're going to do assembly line. So we're going to do code assembly line. And let's take a look. Clam wants in the chat. Let's go. Yeah, I'm excited. All right, so the tests. OK, so these functions, we're not going to worry about them because they're for the tests. But just because I'm curious, I like Rust. I want to know more about stuff. I'm going to kind of look at what they're doing. So for process rate per hour, they're giving a speed and expected rate. And they're just running an assertion. So they're calling assembly line production rate per hour. So they're calling our functions here. So the tests are very simple. They're just calling this with an expected value and a speed. They already have the expected value. And this thing is just doing the math and, and figuring it out. So pretty cool. Um, it's actually what it's doing is it's creating a float for the actual rate. And then it's doing some rounding. And then it's asserting the actual rate minus the expected rate. OK, absolutely. OK, yeah, so it's just doing our assertion here. And then rate per minute is also it's just it's just outsourcing our, salute, our assertion to this function. So that's so that they can keep calling it over and over. So for our first test, we need to do this one. Production rate per hour at speed zero. Speed zero, the expected result is 0, 0.0. It expects a float. So let's just code that up. So let's go to our source directory, our lib, production rate per hour. Now, we can do a conditional, right? Um, if it's between, where is it? One and four, we do 100% success rate here. Let me make this a little bit easier to view. Preview to side. One to four, we're going to do 100. Five to eight, we're going to do 90. Could we use match in this case? I think we can use match. I think we can use match over a range. Great point. I think we can do that. I like matches better than if else. Um, so let's see. I think we can use a match over a range. Let's try that. Good point, Jewish machine. And yes, you could use if else. You absolutely could. I think matches are nicer because there's less, vi it's visually more appealing and match statements kind of lend themselves a little bit better to like the functional side of things where an if else while it would totally work and is very readable i think a match is a little more clear so let's try let's try a match and if we need to we can do an if else or let's start with an if else let's get the test to pass 
and then we'll try the match. So let's start with just a, a thing here. We'll just do if speed equals zero, then we'll just return zero dot zero because we need to return a float. And now if we save, it's going to complain. It's like, hey, you are you need an else, right? You can't just return this. And so what we'll do in our else just to get the test to pass is we'll say else return, I don't know, speed times 221. Of course, this isn't going to pass because, oh, we need to use a float. And here it says, cannot multiply an unsigned 8-bit integer by a float. So the trait multiply by float is not implemented for this. So what we can do is we can say, hey, let's do this as an F64. All right, so let's try running this cargo test. Okay, and our test passes. Great. So now let's try converting this to a match statement. We have our test passing. Let's just do it. So we would do match on speed. And here we would just do zero. If it's zero, we'll return 0, 0.0. Anything else will return speed as an F64. So that we can multiply it. And again, we can use as F64 here because you can convert an unsigned 8-bit integer to a float. So that's why we're able to do this. It's not unsafe. It's, it's totally fine. And we'll multiply that by 221.0. And we just need a comma here and a comma here. And let's run our test because, again, we're doing test-driven development. If all goes well, this should pass. Great. Yeah, it feels cleaner for sure. So let's go to our next test. So our next test is going to be the same function, but it's going to pass it one. And what it's expecting is it's expecting, again, if I pull this up here, let me pull the readme up again. Sorry, I keep closing it, but I think it's useful to have it open to see the, in fact, you know what I like to do? I'll probably, let me copy this out and we'll write that right into our code. Just so we know, just comment it out. Just so we have it, just so we have it. So we don't have to keep going back and forth. All right, so let me put my test next to it too. Uh, the test is under test slash assembly line orders. Okay, so it's expecting uh, for a production rate of one to be 221, for four to be 884, that's because four is 100%. And then we have tests for the other percents. Let's just handle the one in four case for now. So we're going to go ahead and unignore these two. Let me make myself a little bit smaller. So I'm out of your way. And let's go ahead and run our tests. So we're going to clear it. We're going to run cargo test. Those tests should fail. So they passed. And the reason they passed is because our fallback is just returning the correct thing. So zero goes here, one and four go here, and they're 100% success rate, so that works. Okay, cool. But now let's try with these. So we're gonna uncomment these, so seven and nine. So we're testing that seven and nine should return variable rates, right? Seven should be a 90% success rate, and nine should be at 77%. So if we just simply run our tests now, they're gonna fail. <laughs> we have two failures, and we can see why. Um, we can see that they failed in their testing. So it actually doesn't say why, because they've kind of masked it in their, uh, I mean, you, you can see your actual rate minus expected rate isn't equal, but it doesn't tell you the values. So now we need to handle that situation. So let's try using a range. So we'll do one, two, four, because I believe ranges are inclusive. We'll find out. Should be this. Uh, and then, Five to eight should be speed as F64 times 221.0 times, and we have to 90% it. So to do that, we just multiply by 90.9, right? Math. 
Rangers are definitely not inclusive if I remember correctly. Okay, so what we'll do is we'll see if this works, and if it doesn't, we will fail, and we'll retry it. And then here we'll do nine to 10. And so I think there is a way to make them inclusive. Maybe it's this. I forget. We'll try it in a second. But so for this one, we'll do 0.77. So let's run our test. Oh, and here, um, it says here, exclusive range pattern syntax experimental. Ah, great point. Okay, so we need to do the inclusive, which I believe is something like this. Let me see. Rust inclusive range equals. Ah, that's right. Equals, equals, equals. It loves it. Okay, speed. Non exhaustive patterns, not covered. In short, all possible cases are covered. It's not covered because speed can be, it's an unsigned 8 bit integer, right? So it can be anything up to the max of what an unsigned 8 bit integer can represent. So in that case, we'll just close it out here. And if it's anything else, we'll just return zero. We could even probably just say, you know, anything greater than nine, which I believe would be, uh, let's see, infinity, rust range to infinity, although it can only go to 10. So really it's going to be bound. So let's just leave it at that. Maybe we can just do this. Yeah. So let's do that. So let's do that. Um, although it really should be bound but okay so let's break it down so if it's zero just return zero if it's um anywhere between one and four return just it, it works at 100 percent. so itself times 221 obviously is a float five to eight by nine multiply it by 0 0.9 percent jewish machine said probably just throw an error if there wasn't if this wasn't just an exercise exactly you would throw an error if it was out of bounds or you would type speed such that it could only be of numbers zero to not 10, right? You make an enumeration and say, hey, it can only be within these bounds. And then you can never code that error. You would actually block the error before compile time, which would be, I think, ideal. Um, so if it's five to eight, we go at 90%. And if it's anything greater than nine, at this point, we're just gonna say 77%. So let's run it. Great, and we pass. And now I just wanna comment on something, math. Right? Look at this duplication. Speed as F64 times 221. Speed is F64 times 221. Speed is F64 times 221. The only difference here is what we're multiplying it by. So why not break that out, right? Let's move that out. We're just doing math. So what if we just broke this part out? Moved it out here, because again, our match evaluates to something. So what if we just do something like this? Five by one. 0.9, right? So we just move that out math style, right? So speed is an F64 times 221 times the result of this match. And so in this case, it would have to be 1.0 to represent 100%, right? That should work. What it is, those boy in the chat, welcome. Good to have you. So that should work, right? Um, so let's let's try it, and it's uh I like that. And again, we we're using TGD, so we'll know if we messed it up. We didn't. Great. So we just moved that up, math. And the reason we were able to do that is because the match again returns the result. So the match is going to return this value based on whatever speed is, and we're just multiplying it by that. So pretty simple, pretty awesome. Now let's get on to the next bit. So let me just go ahead and move this over so we can see what we want to test. Okay, so the next bit is testing the production rate per minute at speed zero. So production rate per minute, if you pass it zero, should be zero. If you pass it a speed of one, 
the rate should be three, and that's because 221 divided by 60. Oh, where's my calculator? 221 divided by 60 is, ah, so it's rounding down because you, you it, only, it only wants full parts. So yeah, that makes sense. Okay, so we're, we're basically just gonna divide by 60. But the key thing here, the, the, you're like, why? That's not even that hard. <laughs> it's because we need to convert it to an unsigned integer because we're dealing with floats. We need to get that float to an unsigned integer. That's why this exercise is the second part because they think it's a little more complicated. All right, so let's just go ahead and unignore these. And we'll do some conversions. We can handle we can handle conversions. Come on. All right, so we're going to clear this out. Run cargo test. Those tests will fail. What tests fail? The production rate. Why? Because we haven't implemented it. All right, I'm going to just close the test because I think we have a good understanding of what we need to do. Right? So we need to take the speed. So we need to calculate the amount of working items at speed. So we need to take the speed. We're going to get our production rate. So let's do um, let rate per hour equal production rate per hour. We're going to just call our function at speed. That's going to give us a float F64, right? And then if we just try to do the division here, it's going to fail. So let's just try it just to illustrate it. So we're going to return rate per hour divided by 60 because there's 60 minutes in an hour now check it out it's like whoa you cannot divide an f64 by an integer so we're like okay we'll divide by float but now it's going to tell us whoa you can't return a float it's expecting an unsigned 32-bit integer so what if we just did this will that work we're saying parse this as an unsigned 32-bit integer, but will it properly round it down or do we need to be explicit? Well, let's run our test. That's the best way to find out, right? Does this work? And it works. So why does it work? Let's go over it. Jewish machine in the chat, not gonna lie, I wouldn't have thought of that. Yeah, at first I was like, this this part you're talking about, it. I'm assuming, yeah. I saw it duplicated and I was like, ah, this should work because I remember the match speed. Um, so that makes sense. But yeah, for this one, okay, so we're what we're doing is we're getting the rate per hour just by calling our function. We're then dividing it by 60 as an unsigned 32-bit integer. If we wanted to be more clear, could we just round it first just to make it maybe more readable? Because like, what this is doing is that we're assuming that converting it to an unsigned 32-bit integer rounds it down. What if we wanted to be more explicit? We didn't want to have that mystery Let's try it. So again, our tests are passing, so there's nothing we can risk here. We can always go back to this. So I'm just going to go ahead and comment this out. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to do um, let full, let's do let working items per minute equal rate per hour. Let's just copy this. Dot round. And then let's just go ahead and return that. Ah, so round is still returning F64. So that's not even gonna do, do it for us. So I think what we had was probably the best approach. So we'll leave it, worth a try. But yeah, so we convert it to a 32 bit integer, unsigned, and we're good, our things still pass. We're all set. Awesome. I don't think there's anything much more we can refactor. I'm pretty pretty pleased with this. So Juju Machine said, I was just setting rate per hour as F32 instead of the whole thing. Oh, that, that actually could work too. So instead of, that's a great point. Let's try that out. So instead of doing that, we just make 60 that, and then you can just do that. And let's try that out. That should work too. Awesome. That does work. So yeah, I think Either way is, is totally, totally fine. This is just, I think, 
maybe expresses that the result the entire result of that is an unsigned 32 but i think either way that is totally fine and looks looks great so awesome work dose boy typecasting kind of um it's not as much casting as it is parsing in this but yeah it basically is you could think of it as casting basically i mean it, it basically is casting but it does some with the guys that it actually does manipulate the value because again 221 divided by three is not three flat it's three dot whatever we saw in our calculator so it is doing some manipulation there but it's safe all right so let's go ahead and submit this and let's see what other folks are doing exercise it oh i'm on the wrong one there we go refresh let's see what we got let's see what we got let's see what we got We've analyzed this and not found anything that needs changing. We do have one additional comment that you might like to check. Great job. All right, let's take a look. Let's see the comments. How do we see the comment? I want to see the comment. Also, I will be donating to this once we're done going through it. So if anyone uses this, I highly encourage. It's a open source tool. A lot of people are contributing their hard work to it. Maybe we'll contribute to it. That'd be even that'd be even cooler. But let's see, what is it? It's telling me it has a comment and I would like to see it. How do we see it? Let's see. Hmm. Rust analyzer has some comments in your solution, which may be useful. How do I see it? Do I have to do something? Let's learn more. Oh. All right, well, we'll check it out. Let's look at what the other community is doing. Maybe we did, maybe it's because I included that comment and it threw it off. I don't know. Let's see how other folks are solving it. So, community solutions for assembly line. Oh, this return person here. Oh, cool. Oh, this is cool. So they've actually, they haven't gone to infinity. They've gone to the max value. That's cool. Same thing they did here, except they converted speed. Oh, okay. So they did it similar. I like the way this is structured though. I like that the order of this actually is very nice. They're saying 221 times the speed is S64. We did it flipped, but this is, is kind of cool because you can see that number right up front. And they did the same thing down here. That's cool. They called it cars. That makes sense. Pretty awesome. Pretty awesome. Here's another one where they just used the anything else. I think that's a great way to do it. But yeah, ideally we would gate it so that it only allowed 10, but pretty cool. All right, I'm pretty happy with ours. I think I'm gonna go, go for it. So let's go back to assembly line, iterations. Let's mark as complete. This is pretty cool, right? I love exorcism. I think this is like honestly one of the best tools and I'm not even using it to its fullest. Like there's a mentor feature where you can actually have someone mentor you and read through your solutions. You can comment on other solutions. You can have iterations. So if we didn't do something really great the first time, we could look at other people's solutions and yeah, we copy them. <laughs> but no, I mean, that's not that it's about learning. So you try it, you try your own iteration and I like sharing all iterations so that you can see I'm not perfect. The first time we go up, we'll, we'll have, you know, I'm sure as it gets harder, we're going to have a lot of iterations. We'll find ways we could do things better but these ones are relatively easy, so it's not too bad. But yeah, highly recommend it, really highly. And if this isn't selling you on it, then pff, I don't know, because I think this is super cool. So we've completed assembly line. Uh, we're one step closer to learning Rust, and we're at 10.30, so let's go, let's do one more, let's do one more. So let's go on to the next concept. Structs, the vector macro, let's do structs. The vector macro is so cool though. Let's do structs. Health statistics. Learn structs to store statistics for a health monitoring system. It's often useful to group a collection of items together or handle those groups as units. In Rust, we call such we call such a group a struct, and each item is one of a struct's fields. A struct defines the general set of fields available, but a particular example of a struct is called an instance. And we're familiar with structs from the book, but if you're not, hey, we're going to learn them right now. Let's see what we need to do. 
So cool, right? And they really redid this UI. Oh my God, it's fantastic. I love it. It's just friendly. I don't know. I feel like it's friendly. I really want to contribute to this. Maybe we'll do a video where we actually try to add some exercises or maybe we'll mentor. That'd be cool. Not ready yet, but hey, are we ever really ready? You know. All right, instructions. You're working on implementing a health monitoring system. As part of that, you need to keep track of users' health statistics. You'll start with some stub functions in an implementation block, as well as a f the following struct definition. Now remember, we have structs, we have implementation blocks. That's where we implement the functions on the struct, right? Your goal is to implement the stubbed out methods on the user struct defined in the implementation block. For example, the new method should return an instance of the user struct with the specified name, age, and weight values. The weight method should return the weight of the user. The set age method should set the age of the user. All right, let's do it. I'm excited. It's been a while. It's been a while since I've dealt with this stuff. So, um, copy. Oh, let's do it here. Let's go back out. Well, Rust code health statistics. Before I do that, let me just close this. All right, let's open up health statistics. All right, source. So let's look at the tests. Okay, so the tests, what are they doing? Boom. Um, we have a name, Ebenezer, age, 89, weight, frail frail that's frail come on frail it's okay ebenezer poor ebenezer um test name user so there the first test is creating user new name dot into so they're taking this name calling into why what does it do performs a conversion Oh, because it's a string slice, maybe it converts to a string. Um, age and their weight. So they're sending the user the name, the age, and the weight, and then they're just asserting that it properly set the name. Pretty easy. All right, let's code it up. Let's code it up. New, unimplemented. It should set the name, the age, and the weight for the user. So what do we need to do? Well, all we really need to do is create a new user. Destruct, we're gonna do name, age, weight. We're using the shorthand. We could be doing something like this. Right, that's the same. To prove it, let's just run our tests. Cargo test. Our test fails. Oh, our test fails, we didn't do it. Um, test name, oh. Panic at not implemented, line 21. We didn't implement name. We have to implement name, which gets you the name. So let's do that. So for name, it's just gonna do self.name. And here, because remember we're passing the reference there, it says expected string, found string. And so what we can do there is just grab self.name. And let's run the test. Our test passes, and now let's try doing the shorthand that we wanted to try before. All right, try it out. Beautiful. It works kind of like Python then. Yes, exactly. So it's like um, Python in that sense. JavaScript has that kind of syntax too. So yeah, so you were just returning username. And yeah, in this case, self.name, uh, if this is what you're talking about. Yeah, so the way that these similar to Python where Python gets self for its implementation of a class, you're also getting self. The difference here is that um, we're getting a reference to self so that we can actually grab it without taking ownership because it's a function, it's a public function. We don't wanna take ownership. And that's why you have this, this reference here. So, and here we have a mutable one where we can actually manipulate self. So we're getting a mutable reference to self. This is an immutable one. Okay, so. Age. Let's just implement age. For good. We know how to do it, right? It's gonna be the same thing, right? Same thing for weight. Uh, 
I think this this exercise is mostly just showing you getting muscle memory around using um, structs. What does it say? Expected unsigned 32. Oh, so here it's actually expecting a string slice. See the reference there, but here it's expecting just the unsigned 32. So we don't need to. We're good. OK, so let's run our test. Make sure we didn't break anything when we did that. I'm sure we didn't because we added new functions. And let's go back to our test. So let me open up our tests here. So the next thing we want to test, pull that over so you can all see it. Here, let me move out of your way. There. So our next test is um, test age. So we want to test that creating the new user gets the age and the weight. We just coded those. So let's go ahead and unignore those and run our test. Move out of your way. Awesome. So we passed. So we're good. Now, the next thing we're going to need to work on is testing set age. So let me move again. I'm just going to keep moving. I'm going to keep popping around the screen, popping around. The screen. That's OK. So we're going to test set age. Now, let's take a look at this because we're actually setting. We're actually manipulating the user, right? So we have a new age, the new age, no, new age. Uh, we're setting that to an unsigned 32-bit integer of 90. Now, we create a mutable user. Why do we create a mutable user? Because we're going to mutate it. We create our new user using our new function, which we've implemented here. We're calling set age, passing it the new age. We're starting out with the original age, which is 89. We're passing it 90 because Ebenezer had a birthday. Happy birthday, Ebenezer. And we're asserting that the user does, in fact, have that new age. And we're doing the same thing here with weight. So let's go ahead. Let's just try both of these. Let's just go ahead and uncomment these. And let's try set, creating both of those setters. So I'm going to move this over. I'm going to get out of your way here. And let's go on set age. So for set age, we have our mutable self. So what we can do is we can do self dot age equals new age. And then here we can do. Oh, and so the other thing is um, we're mutated here. So we probably want to return self. Actually, I don't think we need to because I think this actually will return. Let's try the same thing here. So we can do self dot um, weight equals new weight. Let's see, what is this underline for? I think that's just showing that it's mutable, probably. Could be. Let's run our test. Let's see. Let me make sure I ignored them. I unignored them. Okay, we're good. The other cool thing with Rust Analyzer is I can actually run the test right here. So you can see I ran that individual test. It's a pretty cool feature, but again, I'm just gonna um, I'm gonna run all the tests. So for that, I will use cargo test, and we're good. Our test passed. So pretty straightforward, pretty easy one. We just implemented a struct, uh, a user struct, it, to get that muscle memory of using structs again. It's been a while since we went through that part of the book, but let's go over it just to to kind of see what we did here. So. You have your struct, and we've made it public, and that's how our test was able to consume that and use that. And it has a name, which is a string, capital S, not a string slice, an age, which was an unsigned 32-bit integer, and a weight, which was a float, a 32-bit float. We had our new function where we just construct a new user. We're just simply using the user. We're saying that we have a user struct. We're using the shorthand to pass it name, age, and weight. Again, if these had different argument names, we would just have to do, you know, name. Let's say this, for example, was initial name or something. We'd have to do something like this, right? Uh, but we're lucky we had the same arguments. Then we created a function to grab name. And here again, we're getting the reference to self, we're calling self.name. We're getting the reference to age. Uh, we're calling self.age. The reason we have this here is because this is expecting a string slice. And so we need to pass it a string slice, whereas by default, name is a string. So by passing a reference, we're passing a reference to that string, passing a string slice. Here, we don't need to do that because we just want an unsigned 32-bit integer, which age already is. So you can think of this as just doing that conversion. Um, although the book explains in a lot more detail why this is. And it doesn't have to feel like C, where you're just like, oh, just throw an asterisk. It'll work. It's really important to understand this thing. It's the concept of ownership and borrowing. 
Um, and that's a great chapter of the book. So definitely check it out. We're not really dealing with borrowing too much here. Um, because if you look at our tests, test slash, um, when they call a function like set age, they're not passing it the user. So we're, it's not like we're taking ownership of the user, we're performing these operations on the user. And that's why they're, they're in this implementation block. And so here you have set age, we simply just set the age. And the key thing here, and I think it's why Rust Analyzer actually underlined it, is we have the mutable self. This is important. We're declaring that it is mutable. We can mutate it. So that's why we have self.age. We're actually able to mutate self.age. Now you may say, hey, but we're not returning the user. We're just doing the mutation. Because we've left off the semicolon, we actually are. Oh yeah, there's bots in the chat. Get out of here, bots. Because we are not, we're leaving off the semicolon and this, this statement will actually return self, right? It actually will return the new self, the result of the mutation. If we did put the semicolon, it will not work. It will work. I don't know. That's weird. Oh, because it's mutating the user. Sorry, it's operating on the user. So that's totally fine as well. Uh, you don't ignore me. But basically, if you did actually want a response and you put the semicolon, you would have to explicitly return. But because we're just mutating, I forgot. We have mutating. We're just mutating that value, so it gets mutated. <laughs> so you're just like, lol, yeah. It's not going to work. It worked. Yeah, so um, I'm actually going to put that on because I think it makes more sense that it's there now that I now that I see it, now that I fool myself. All right, I don't think there's much more we can change, so let's do exorcism submit, and let's see what other folks did, and then we can wrap it up for tonight. Health statistics. My health statistics are pretty good. Got my booster shot today. Excited about that. All right. So we're all done. No recommendations. Awesome. Let's see what other folks have done. Ah, 13W is a return user. Always got some high rated solutions. Okay, so this is cool. So instead of using user, they just use self. That's pretty cool. The cool thing about that is if you change the name of the struct, it'll still work. So that's really cool. I like that use of self as opposed to the use of user. Other than that, we're all good. Cool. 13 dubs. <laughs> Young God. All right. So we're going to mark it as complete, share all the iterations. And let's see what other concepts we have. We're going to vector macro. Awesome. So we're going to call it here for tonight. Got to rest off that booster shot, but we're going to continue. We're going to continue next Tuesday. We're going to go through vector macro. We're going to do destructuring. We're going to do tuples. We'll move on to the rest of them. Option vector as a stack entry API. So we'll just continue on through. We're going to stop here today. We did functions, enums, floating points, integers, structs. I want to give a shout out in the chat. Juge machine. It was awesome having you here live. Come back next Tuesday if you're around. If not, you can always catch it on YouTube. This video will be posted. Well, if you're watching on YouTube, it's posted already, but it will be posted today or tomorrow. But yeah, happy to have people in the chat. It's always super fun to have that participation. I enjoy it. And like I said, I always like just live coding. Um, thank you, Juice Machine. Greatly appreciated. And yeah, Juice Machine said thanks a lot. Absolutely. Always here to, to help collab with people. And thank you. You really, it's always great having people to chat with during this, you know, going through this stuff. It's what keeps me going. Shout out to Dozeboy in the chat, Clam Watts in the chat. Thank you for stopping by. If you're watching on YouTube and you like what you see, classic streamer plug, hit the like button, hit the subscribe button. If you want to see any other videos, again, youtube.com slash Tomagirl. We got building an HTTP request with Rust, trying out Subabase back in as a service, some other cool videos. If you like the exercises, we did the Rustlings exercises, another uh, Rust exercise kind of course you can go through. There were three videos on that. They haven't changed much, so those should be pretty pretty up to date and recent. And of course, the Rust book. We went through the whole Rust book. We did a Rust review. And again, we'll be continuing here next week, next Tuesday, 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. on twitch.tv slash Tom McGurl. We'll be going through vector macros, destructuring tuples, and maybe even further from there. Exorcism.io, check it out. I'll also be committing this code you can follow me on Exorcism, um, Tom McGurl. It's just using my GitHub. So follow me there. You can see my solutions, but also copy them out and I'll, I'll put them up on GitHub as well. 
So check out the GitHub. It's just Tom McGurl. All the solutions to everything we do gets posted up there. Follow on Twitter for when I go live. And that's that's basically it. So again, thank you for stopping by. I'm loving exorcism.org. It used to be .io. It's, it's just a really cool way to like, you're using the CLI, you're seeing what others are doing. I want to comment on some other stuff. I want folks to comment on my stuff, so hop in there. I'm going to continue going through the Rust one. Some of it's a review, but I need it. I'm not going to lie, I've been rusty. Had had the baby, took like a, a little hiatus. I'm coming back, so it's going to help me. So it might be a review for some of you, but hey, what's that's how we learn, right? The muscle memory. And I'm sure it's going to get more complicated. Once we finish the exorcism exercise, we'll probably go on and build off some more, try out some more crates. We tried out the request crate. Maybe we'll try actually doing a post request using the request crate. That would be pretty cool. And then I want to actually check out some of the web server frameworks for Rust. There's quite a few of them where you can build a web server with Rust. I think that'll kind of be pretty cool. We did that as our final project. We built our own. I want to try using some of the existing crates. So yeah, and then probably more exorcism stuff. I've mentioned this before. I use Elixir a lot. I'm a, that's another language I'm very passionate about. So if there's any interest in checking out Elixir, um, I'd be down to do that. And I don't even want it to take away from the Rust stuff. So maybe I'll just add a day where we do that so we can keep with both, both content. We'll see. There's only so much time a person has. Come on. But anyway, thank you for hanging out. If you hung out in the chat live, thank you. If you're on YouTube watching, I appreciate it. Thank you so much. It's been really humbling to see the comments. I love it. Love to see it. Thank you for subscribing. Leave a comment below. I love to answer them. It makes my day. Say you like it. If you don't like it, just be like, yo, this is whack. That's cool too. I just like to see that people are watching. Thank you so much and have a good night. Later.